Thank you, Colin, and um, thank you to Deanna and to Margaret, especially for uh, organizing this reading uh, with Brick. And um, the other authors are also published by Brick this spring, and they're wonderful. It's wonderful. Been touring with them, and. Um, what else do I, uh, I, I want to get that earth-centered privilege, uh, I, I, I want to get the first part of that, I, I remember the punchline forever, but I need the other part. Um, and I just want to thank especially Brick Books and Kitty, our general manager, who's indefatigable, and uh, they're just a marvelous press, and I've been so lucky and privileged to be published by them, so... Even though nobody from Brick is here, I suppose, uh, Brick is in the room. Um, so uh, I want to pay attention to the time. All right. All right. Let's see. Okay. Uh, so, as Colin said, my book is um, set in Montreal. Uh, it considers a musician and um, a, a fiber artist, Donnie and Ari. And um, the main action of the book goes over the course of the better part of a year, starts in the winter, and uh, ends in the spring, uh, or actually ends in the fall, rather. And um, what, am I doing something wrong? <laughs> And, I mean, the most important thing is that you can hear me. I just want to make sure. Um, and uh, the, um, well, probably enough said. But anyway, there, there are a few poems in the beginning. Oh, the, the book is set in 2006. And uh, Donnie is trying to uh, get together um, a performance of Monteverdi's L'Orfeo, the opera, because it's going to be the 400th anniversary in 2007. So, and there are a few poems at the very beginning um, that are set earlier at the beginning of Donnie and Ari's relationship. So I'll read the first poem in the book, which is about that. Um, the title of this poem is Hashalaga, which is the name that the uh, Iroquois gave to the spot, which we now think is Montreal. Or Hashalaga. Donnie found her weaving on the river island, airy, mythic maiden, heavy braid hanging down her back. Behind the castle of her loom, she crossed threads in ancient code, cotton, silk, hemp, and wire. Though Jewish law forbade the blend of wool and flax, Ari wove these two, unaware the Romans banned a woman with a spindle from appearing in the square lest she curse the harvest. She left her shuttle's quiet slide, windows open to river breeze, to buy her rice and nuts en Saint Laurent. Her solitude woke in him solicitude. Is this why he chose to save her, uh, to set her a jewel in his firmament? Uh, the next poem is, well, actually, I'll read um, a poem uh, from uh, Donnie's perspective. It's one of the first poems I wrote, and uh, I think it gives us some insight into Donnie and his occupations, preoccupations. It's called Feast and Famine. Donnie can remember when Ari ate it all, pod thai and paella, pulled pork and pozzoli, veal stuffed with apples and pâté de foie gras. Now she rejects his meat and all the rest. From their plush days of courtship, he recalls melon slices rolled in slivers of prosciutto, followed by couscous, osso buco, or cassoulet, menus he'd spend days devising. When did it change? What broth must he feed her? What seed? How temper his own guts twisting as he waits? He blanches pearl onions for palak paneer and roasts a baby pig on a spit until its skin crackles. When, when will she feast with him again? One of the things that's going on in the uh, drama of the book is that uh, Ari's mother is dying. I'm trying to vary my reading for the sake of my 
comadres. <laughs> um, this is called Black Leather Couch. Black leather couch on which she'd lain all fall, Ari's mother, like a dry leaf. Its slippery crease swallowed everything. Crochet hooks, paper clips, receipts, a postcard from Ari's sister, Sophie, 1992. Her mother's words. Get the radio, she'd say, pointing to a glass of water. The rings fell off her fingers. While she napped, Ari knitted, something she'd begun at college to keep awake during class. Mother owned closetfuls of yarn, so Ari helped herself. Now Mother slept under a shawl and fretted when awake. Do you believe in ghosts? Click, click, went Ari's needles. Mother'd always demanded the empirical. I believe in souls, said Ari. That's what I meant. I've never been so scared. She cried whenever Ari's dad got up to get a glass of milk, her pills, a blanket. By October, she was always cold. What did I do wrong? Why are they angry? No one's angry, mother. But Ari's tongue was just a plug of dirt. She stroked her mother's naked hand. I'll never knit a tea bag again. The Book of Life. Though Ari won't believe in God, she knows that something somewhere must be counting. Calories and carbon use, every inner tube she's ever burst, every acid crusted battery. Somewhere there's a ledger for the damage of existence. Each bottle top and what it cost the earth, the atmosphere, accruing to the rubbish mountain of her soul. Joy is only misery, sorry, joy is only sugar, an empty source of energy and happiness, a fiction. It's misery and guilt that architect the real. And the body, the body's just another spring of discipline. Something counts, each lick, each sip, each chew, each mile she runs with weights on arms and legs, up and down the neighborhood, so early that she wakes the dogs. Uh, Ari and Donnie have two children, Stefan, who's about 11, and uh, Ano, who turns six during the course of the story. Mouths of babes. Ari's dying yarn when Stefan lopes into her studio. Headstrong, firstborn, jeans too short again. Can he have a dollar for the dollar store? What will you buy? Though she can guess. Cap gun. He studies, leaves swirling in the sink. The air stretches. Don't you have enough? They're all broke. She tries to squash the knot of righteousness crawling up her throat. Hasn't she told him about plastic, about waste, the garbage patch sprawled the width of continents, half a billion tons? When we throw away, it just goes somewhere else. He looks up, shoots her with his eyes. So it's over anyway, and it's your fault. Her fingers probe her pocket for some change. This is called Water Cycle, and it's in five parts, the parts of the water cycle, so I'll announce them. Evaporation. It's snowing lightly. Stefan feels it like fingers in his hair as he waits for Dad to drive him to his lesson. He knows Donnie will sit in the hall, pretend to read, but eavesdrop on each note. Condensation. Going home, they stop for preserved lemons. More tubs of yogurt and white cheese than Stefan could ever hope to name. In the car, what did you learn today? The water cycle. Again? 
precipitation. It's hard to figure how could they keep learning the same thing. Each year, they add a little, Stefan supposes. Today, no one knew about infiltration. It was a trick question, Stefan says. Infiltration. Stefan does his homework at the counter. Donnie cooks, cutting chicken, onion, pickled lemon, humming the concerto Stefan's learning. I set your recital date for June. Stefan breaks the pencil tip, gets up to sharpen. Run off. Maybe he'll do it, pack his rucksack, leave his books behind, or only take a few, hide out on the mountain in a tree, sneak back when no one's home, steal bread and cheese, leave not a crumb trailing out the door. This is uh, a poem uh, after Ari's mother dies. Um, it's called Shiva. Always two, two sisters wearing the same dress, measuring more against less. In their father's house, they soap mirrors, clean the fridge of rigid foods, scrape the oven floor, wash sheets and towels in case a cousin comes to stay, vacuum behind the piano, tie together stacks of moldy books to cart out to the curb. Two, two, who misses her most? Ari lays her head on a silk scarf, sips its fragrant spice. Sophie pins a brooch inside her sweater, strokes its cold stone. Will they divide each teacup from its saucer, divorce each pair of shoes? Who judges? Who has more? Who more to lose? Winter lasts a long time in this book. <laughs> um, so we'll, um, we'll skip to spring. Uh, Donnie is also a professor of music. Male gaze. Donnie crosses campus looking for a treat. April is the cruelest month, he thinks. Trees put forth, pansies widen velvet eyes. His own eyes feel like weary slits between parentheses. The cruelest cut is women, girls. For what is he if not a boy? Parading naked arms and legs, breasts peeking out like balls of cream from pastry shells, or small and loose. Skirts, straps, sandals, shorts, all that glowing, all that smooth. He weighs, which one? Though he'd never, they'd always been the ones. Cafe creme in hand, he turns to a contralto. Professor Bacchus? Fifties, sweater set, and pearls, ironically deployed. Pretty enough face, but flaccid. She bats her doll glass eyes. Something fun this summer? Oh, you know, the usual. No need to tell her all his plans. Research, auditions, rehearsals, Nova Scotia. And you? He's stirring. Diverted by her summer charms, shorter skirt, sweetheart neck, no bra. His brain hamster scrambles, chamber ensemble, chorus, early music history, that's it. Last year, her smartish paper on women's singers in the Gonzaga court. Monteverdi's Lariana, a warning against women choosing husbands for themselves. Marika. He almost shouts, and in reply, she lilts. Know anyone who needs a babysitter? Um, uh, Donnie's auditioning for his opera, and this is called Bel Canto. 
Auditioning sopranos, Donnie wants their voices clear and lean. Whether cocky, meek, stout, or graceful, he draws from each her gifts. The best know how to juggle breath past the cords, to lift the palate like a cat and spin. He needs surprise and color, mahogany, apples, shadow, brass. He must have callus, Schwarzkopf, Sutherland. If their cheeks, their teeth, their eyes, if all be flushed and glistening, if his hand might draw her water from its well, paint sun-sliced clouds on chapel vaults, as if he, anyone, still believed in angels. Um, the, the middle section of the book concerns um, both Ari's project and Donnie's project. Um, hers is um, Fiber Arts Tapestries called the Human Footprint Series, and uh, they're about, you know, the ecological crisis and <laughs> our, our race to disaster. Um, so one of the first poem in this section is about weaving and and uh, abandoning weaving actually for something else. Um, it's called Crisscross. Castle and heddle, the warp, the weft, a web, a cloth, a nap, the stuff. Take yarn, manila, sendal, and cross tufts of rabbit, merino floss, fiber, worsted, linen, and jute. Throw down a pattern, unravel a suit of seawater, nacre, opal, and clay, plated ribbons steeped in dark tea, skeins of skin, brocaded bones, a bolt of tulle, a pile of bo stones, milk and sugar, a cotton web, a veil of clouds, a coat of reeds. Cut the length, leave hang the thrum, fray the fringe, abandon the loom. I think I'll read three more. Um, this one's called Burial, and um, it's the first time you'll hear about uh, Anno, the smaller son. Burial. Ari's made a white thing, pale oblong of linen, warp, crossed in wool and cotton, old lace bits from her grandmother's veil. Anno finds her in the garden, digging, New greening leaves smell like bugs and varnish. What are you doing? Round her head, his mother wears a kerchief knotted at the nape. Even when her eyes are red, she's pretty. I'm burying this cloth. Anno fetches his blue shovel. Do you want help? The cloth glows on the short grass. Why do you want to bury it? When Grandma was buried, Stefan told him, an elevator lowered her coffin into a hole. Each grown-up said something in Hebrew, through shovelfuls of dirt. Just for a little while, I want to distress it. Why does his mother want the cloth to look sad? Together, they shovel until she asks him to stop. She lays the cloth in its small grave. They cover it with dirt and stones. You can jump on it, she says. Soon he will be six. From under the porch he fetches his rope, arcs it overhead, skips into its blurred orbit. Um, so in the middle of the book, I have a few of Ari's tapestries recreated in language. <laughs> and. Um, each one has a little recipe like you would see in a gallery. So this is the tapestry, and then there's the um, ingredients, the materials list, really, is what, what we call it in, in uh, you know, <laughs> art, the art world. Um, so this one is called Horse Latitudes, Human Footprint Series Horse Latitudes. 
Thus does it enter the food chain. Picnic straw, party favor, six-pack collar. A bobbled slaw forms the great Pacific garbage patch. Elastic gyre, litter midden, invisible to satellite photography, despite its size and density. A mass of hidden particles, broken down by water's flux and flow to a toxic sludge and mermaid's tears, fine plastic pellets resembling fish eggs. This soup's consumed by filter feeders, barnacle, worm, squirt, and flea, who nourish sea turtles, seals, and those mythical birds whose dance is a chorus of castanets, beak on beak of hoots and calls and quick neck tuck to fluff an underwing. They mate, innocent of syringe, of toothbrush, chosen from this pile of dross to choke their feeding chicks, these Cleopatra-eyed, lazen albatross. Mary Bacchus, 2006, paint, rags, string, grocery bags, screen door mesh, twist ties, bottle tops, shells, feathers, condoms, fish bones, ambergris, 100 by 120 centimeters. <laughs> um, the last poem I'll read is called The Long Marriage. Lilac crowned Amazon, birthday gift from 30 years ago. Ari doubts her mother knew how long a parrot lasts or how his chromosomal structure would make him flirt with men, not her, who only gets his jealous peckings. Still, it's hard to keep herself from stroking his iridescent mauve, his ruby splashes. Donnie built a roost from bolted plumber's pipe, wooden dowels, and old refrigerator shelves where perches Prince calling for his breakfast, chopped almonds, carrot sticks, and apples. Open stone beak, extend black bean tongue. Master settles to his own bowl, yogurt and granola, and listens to the music of his best-fed child. Thank you. <laughs>